All right. Thank you so much for joining us here this afternoon. In this session, we're going to be talking about some of the new releases for serverless. Now, you've probably heard some of the things that have been going on, exciting news like you can now put Lambda functions inside of a camera, or serverless Aurora, which is going to be a way to do request-driven SQL database accesses. And as exciting as those are, we're not going to be talking about them in this session. In this session, we're going to focus mostly on Lambda and API Gateway. I'm Tim Wagner. I'm the G general manager for those two services. And I'm looking forward to talking about some of the really exciting and innovative work that we've been doing in the serverless space. But first, we've got a little bit of a tradition here in our serverless track of finding ways to keep getting rid of servers. We had so much fun last year with our disappearing server magic act that we thought we would try something like that again. So we're going to actually do the classic cutting a lady in half, only today with a bit of a serverless twist. And another server bites the dust. OK, back to business. So for a little bit of our context setting today, I thought we'd talk about the day in the life of a developer. So we're going to have this developer. We're going to call him Joe. And it's going to be a pretty typical day for Joe. His manager shows up at his desk and says, you know, I got a bunch of work for you to do. We don't have a lot of time. We don't have a lot of money. You're not going to get a lot of help. I kind of want it done yesterday. And oh, by the way, let's make sure when we do it that it's fully scalable and reliable and ready to take additional traffic. Now, Joe, who knows all about serverless, says, hey, not a problem. 
And he says that because he knows that with serverless, a lot of these classic challenges go away. Because serverless is first and foremost about getting rid of the challenge of dealing with infrastructure. With Lambda, for example, that means not having to deal with provisioning, deploying, monitoring, or managing those servers. There's no software to install, no machines to administer, and that is going to make Joe and ultimately the rest of his team more agile. Now, serverless also means that these key application capabilities, like being highly available or providing metrics and logging, come built in. And that batteries included approach makes it not only easier to get started, it lowers the cost and complexity of ownership over time, enabling companies to build and deliver value faster. Now, serverless approaches offer this built-in scalability because they're inherently request-driven. You see that with things like Lambda, API Gateway, and now with our serverless Aurora for SQL data access as well. So for Lambda, for example, instead of having to run a web server to receive requests, Joe can just trust the system to do that on his behalf, which not only frees him from worrying about it, it also means that all of the scalability and fault tolerance can be built right in. And finally, that leads to kind of the final value proposition here, which is no idle capacity. Because you only pay when there's work to do, the work only gets done where there's actual request, and so Joe's accountant ends up being as happy as Joe is. Now, Joe's promised his boss an app, you know, what comes next? Well, the first thing that would be nice is to find a working example. And the way Joe might have done this in the past is go and read a bunch of documentation, go check out some blog articles, maybe do some searches on GitHub or on Google. Because what he'd like to do here is find a way to get something that looks like something pretty close to what he wants. In this case, a serverless web app with an API hosted on API Gateway, using Lambda for some of the computation, maybe storing some session state in DynamoDB, serving up some static content in S3. And so it'd be great if you could find something that really matches that pretty well. Now, fortunately for Joe, we just announced the new serverless application repository. So in addition to the things that he could do in the past, writing functions from scratch or using the single file blueprints, now he can come in and actually search a huge repository of applications that allow him to find things that he wants. And by just typing in a few search terms, he can find something that's a close approximation here and use that as a way to get started. And then what he can do is just fill in a couple of parameters. And the way that these serverless apps work, and they're really just the, the same kind of things that we've been, you've been seeing us do here with the serverless application model, is that you can define the things that need to be specified. In this case, this application probably needs to know an S3 bucket, for example. So for a little bit of searching, typing in the S3 bucket name and a couple of clicks, Joe can have himself an app that's up and working in a matter of minutes here, something that's pretty close to what he's ultimately going to need to ship. So the serverless application repository was designed to close the gap between GitHub and what you can do inside of the Lambda console. So you'll be able to search and browse these ready-made apps as well as sample code. You can customize open source apps and get started really quickly. You can also share apps privately. So you're not constrained only to do things in public. If you have some code you want to share within your organization or within a select set of accounts, you can do that as well. In fact, it follows the same cross-account access mechanism that Lambda functions have today. And one of the nice things about this is that you don't have to change any of the ways that you work. So if you've got source code in GitHub, that's fine. Got a tool chain to build it, that's also fine. Just give us the built artifacts when they're done. Like to work in the Lambda console, we've built it right into that. Prefer to work with the command line or direct calls, all the functionality, all the assets of the repository, all available with APIs as well. And while you certainly don't have to monetize any of this, and we designed it especially for open source and private sharing, if you do want to sell something, if you've got APIs, you can use our built-in API gateway connectivity to the AWS marketplace to really easily build a SaaS application. And of course, we've powered all this with the, with the AWS application, serverless application model, or SAM for short. Now, as I mentioned, all of that's available from the command line and the AWS SDKs, which we'll be revving shortly here in the next few days, um, as well as from the console. 
And speaking of the console, we've been hard at work putting a lot of goodness into that Lambda console. So I'd like to take a second here and show you a little bit about what we've been doing there. There we go. So one of the things we were really focused on is making the Lambda console both approachable for new developers as well as being super efficient for people who use it every day. And so one of the things we've designed to help people get started is a new designer pane here. And you can see that I've, I've picked up the S3 blueprint here, so you're seeing that visualized in the console. So over here on the left, you can see the list of triggers. We've got the S3 trigger set up here. And I can also go over here and pick up, pick up some additional triggers if I'd like to add those. Once I've added a trigger, I can easily come down here, see how it's been configured, or choose to add additional or, or make changes to that configuration. Over on the right here, I've got a visualization of the execution role. So all of the capabilities, all the things that this, that this function can access in a kind of clear, easy to read visual form. Now the designer's nice, especially if, um, especially if this is your, your first time around and you need some, some help understanding how blueprints work and what your function can do. The, um, the other thing that's really nice about uh, the changes we made to the console is that we've taken these, the Cloud9 core capabilities and we've built them directly in. So we've replaced that single file editor that so many of you have used and so many of you have wished would be a little more flexible with a complete powerful experience for multi-file editing. So here you can see that, and I'm actually gonna go into full screen mode here. So first, notice here on the left, you can actually add new files and new folders. So if you need to have multi-files, if you wanna access multiple files within a package, now you can do all of that. Another thing that's really nice here is I'm gonna go ahead and just make a small change. I can save directly from here, and I can also run directly from here. So here you see me having run that, I can get the results and the logs directly in an IDE-like experience. It makes it really easy to go in there and kind of grab those, change them. Uh, we've also made it really easy to set your sample input so you don't lose that across editing sessions. Now, once you run a few times, you know, you can always come over here and check your monitoring. But one of the things that people have been a little bit challenged by is finding the right set of logs. And so we're really excited by this feature that I call log grab and go. I can come in here, highlight a section out of one of these metrics, and then with a single click, I can go find all of the relevant logs. And so it'll take that particular time series and then either for the metrics, or in this case for the logs, it'll go show me all and only the relevant entries from that period of time. It makes it really easy to just go over there and find the, find the information that I'm interested in, especially say if I had an error or an increased latency that I wanna go, I wanna go research. All right. So just kind of summarize some, some of the uh, additions here. So the Lambda function editor, allows you to edit multiple files at once. You can dig into anything in your package. You can add new files and modify existing packages. You can run your tests and do those view results directly within the editor and, complete, and directly within full screen without having to leave that experience. And of course, um, what we launched a little earlier this year is this ability to save those test inputs and reuse them later. They actually travel along with your function, and I'll show you that here in a minute. And of course, especially for those of you who are new to this, we've got that WYSIWYG designer. It makes it a little easier to see what the Lambda function is doing. So in just a few minutes, our developer Joe has been able to find something and build an app that's actually pretty close to what he wants. And had he done this in a traditional way, you know, this would be mostly a prototype. He'd still have to go worry about all the problems of scaling it up and deploying it in production and so forth. But because this is a serverless app, it's not just a prototype, he's actually ready to go. And so uh, earlier this year, of course, we, as most of you know, we expanded the set of concurrent, ex of concurrent executions granted to every account by 10, a factor of 10 to 1,000. And today we're also announcing that um, when you need more, when you contact customer service, as long as your account's in good standing, you're already automatically approved to go up to at least 3x of that and beyond. So 
Joe's pretty happy about this because it looks like he's got a lot of headroom there even without having to do anything special. The other thing that he might be curious about, however, is performance. And I know a lot of you have tried to use Lambda for a variety of use cases and sometimes would like to see that cold start performance get better. And one of the things we've been working on here is ways to optimize cold starts. Now, for those of you who don't know what these are, this is the, either the first time your functions run in a long time or when you're scaling up very rapidly. So there are a lot of new instantiations of a particular function. And it takes a little longer to do that because we have to make sure we get the code, we start up the language runtime, you get through all of your initialization and so forth. And we've been working on compressing those files in more intelligent and more effective ways so that we can make the transfer across the wire as well as the setup that actually runs on the machines behind the curtains a lot faster for your code. Now, your mileage will vary here. You know, small functions won't, won't observe as much of a benefit, so you should definitely like do your own performance studies. But especially for things like large Python and large Node.js functions, we've seen uh, as high as 80% performance improvements here. So we're really excited about the new set of things people will be able to do by getting ever, ever faster latency. Now, part of the batteries included of serverless apps, of course, is that fundamental monitoring capabilities like logging and metering come built in. Now, one challenge that you've told us about is that it can be difficult to find those relevant logs. And that's why we designed that grab and go feature that I just illustrated for you. So that, especially while you're working in the console in an interactive fashion, you can very quickly tie the results of what you're testing and observing back to the underlying log information so that you can debug and diagnose even faster than before. And without having to sift through a lot of different separate log streams because they come back to you as an aggregate. Now, with Lambda functions, you determine how much power you want to give them, how much CPU and memory access you'd like them to have. When we first launched Lambda, you know, um, and started setting this up, you know, we thought, wow, you know, a gig and a half seems like a lot for a Lambda function. But what we've observed and what we've heard from customers is that they keep wanting to bring more and denser compute operations. They want to keep doing more and more time and compute intensive applications in a serverless fashion. And when they do that, they've started hitting the limits of what they can, what they can achieve given the memory of uh, sizes and the CPU power that Lambda currently has. So today we're really excited to announce that we're doubling that capability and functions can go all the way up to, to three gig now. And remember, even though this is a, expressed in memory terms, doubling the memory also doubles the CPU power. So we're really excited about the fact that more complex workloads can now be run on top of Lambda. So Joe's off to a pretty good start here. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's only an hour into his day, but he's already been able to deploy an app. It's pretty close to what he needs. It's far more than a prototype because it's scalable, fault tolerant, it's got logging and metrics built right in, and he's got a lot of headroom here for future growth. So it looks like a pretty good first step. Now Joe goes out, gets a cup of coffee, comes back and says, you know what? Time to solve the actual business problem here. We gotta make some changes and customize this app so that we can actually have it do the job we need it to do. And we're ultimately gonna to wanna to be able to share this with teammates, because even though his boss didn't give him a lot of help right off the bat, he knows that good developer hygiene means he's got pipelines, he's got deployment capabilities, and he's got ways to share and collaborate with that code. And then finally, he's gonna to wanna to be able to also roll out changes, and he's gonna to wanna to do that safely. So he's got this sort of checklist he's gotta go through now. You know, he's gonna start with an authoring environment where he can do some local dev and test and debugging before he pushes that code. He wants to be able to customize the app inside that environment, set up a CDC, CI CD pipeline for his team, and then of course achieve safe deployments. And safely meaning not just that he tests it well, not just that he's got great stages in there for, for uh, uh, testing and pre-production, but also that he doesn't impact customers when he finally does go to deployment in production. So, we're excited to, today to announce the Cloud9 editor experience. And this is gonna solve the first of Joe's challenges here. So when he wants to do more local developing and testing, instead of making live changes to a function directly in the, in the Lambda editor, he now has access to a full-fledged, full-powered serverless IDE in the cloud. 
And before I sort of talk a little more about that, I'm going to hop over here and show you what that looks like. There we go. So here's the Cloud9 editor. And I'm going to give you just a really quick introduction to, um, to some of this. So again, you, we see that experience, kind of multiple files. So we've got that ability to edit things just like, a, just like you would normally on a desktop IDE. And we've got also full integration with the, with the uh, Lambda and other parts of the serverless world here. So I'm going to open up the AWS resources here. And you'll see that I've got a copy of both local functions. And these are things that I have Git cloned down into the IDE to work on. And also down here, I've got access to remote functions. And this is integration super powerful. So I can do things like with edit function, I can actually import code directly from Lambda as well as Git cloning it down into, the, into my IDE here. And then if I make changes, I can choose to hot deploy that back if that's what I want to do. Now, often I want to send that through a pipeline, but you get a choice of how you'd like to interact with it. So we're going to take a, a look at uh, just one simple case here of uh, sort of a little hello world just to, um, just to be able to kind of see what's going on with this. So here's some of my code. I'm going to just get a couple of windows set up here. And one of the nice things here is I also have access to a debugger. And so we're really excited about this. We've heard from a lot of you that you would like to be able to debug and test your code locally so that you've got that kind of really quick, really iterative experience. Now, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get my debugging configuration up here. All right. So here we can see the little debugger. I'm going to go ahead and get that guy set up run my code here. This will give you an illustration of this. Now, what's going to happen going on here in the background is that we've actually taken SAM local. That's our local, uh, our local copy of the Lambda runtime. And it's got all of the files and, and, uh, and setup in an exact clone. And we actually make that available as a Docker image as well. And I'll talk about that in a second. But here we can see our debugger. We've actually we've stopped here on this line. I can come in here and actually get some of the information, so it's a, it's a full interactive IDE debugging experience there. And then I can come over here and do a continuation. And there, once again, we've got all the results and function, back, function log back there. So really excited about this capability here and the increased pr developer productivity. Now, one of the things that's really nice about that is that, about SAM Local, is that it actually works in lots of different IDEs. So I'm really excited about Cloud9. I love that ability, that ability to not have to install and run anything myself. But you know, if I'm on an airplane and I want to just use VS Code, I've got the exact same SAM local experience on there. So I can also carry that local test and debug experience with me on my laptop, even when I'm fully disconnected. All right. So built-in GitHub support, Lambda Blueprint support, uh, App Repository will be, coming, will be coming down the road, SAM Local providing local testing and debugging, and that ability to boy, I, deploy either directly back to Lambda if you like, or you can push your updates back to GitHub. So that's what SAM, our developer, is going to want to do. Right? He wants to make some changes here, but he wants to have a whole pipeline set up. And he can choose to use code pipeline, code build, and code deploy for that if he likes. Of course, he can also bring his own tool chain there, anything that can hook up to, to GitHub and as a source repository. Now, that whole pipeline is great, but before today, that deploy step would have just blasted everything in that application directly out. So all the functions, all the APIs, whatever was present in there, all of them all at once would have gotten updated. That's great if you're just in testing or you're in pre-production, but what if you want to do fault isolation for customers? And this is probably one of the most significant pieces of feedback that we've heard over the course of last year, is this desire to be able to deploy safely and incrementally. And not just for a single function, but transactionally for a group of functions or functions, APIs, and other pieces within an entire serverless application. 
and not just in Lambda, but also in API Gateway, the ability to shape traffic between, for example, you know, two different stages, two different versions of an API. And so this week, we're really excited about this trio of features that we're delivering. First, what we call weighted aliases for Lambda. And this lets you take an alias, for those of you who haven't used them before, they're essentially like symbolic links to a particular version of your code. And you can now actually have an, an alias not just point to a version, but point to two versions with a percentage distribution of traffic between them. So for example, you can use this when you're deploying to be able to send only a portion of traffic to the new version or to roll back to a previous version. And we built something very similar for API Gateway, substages that allow you to split traffic between two different stages or two different versions of an API in very much the same way. And then, if you want to be able to just get a kind of ready-to-go, batteries included setup here, we've extended our existing AWS code deploy service with automatic support for safe serverless deployments. And so we've given it several different styles of rollout. You can do, you can do linear, you can control the time frame, um, you can do sort of pre and post acceptance testing. And it's kind of the, the batteries included, all singing, all dancing thing, if you would like to actually just have that completely built in. And you can hook that right up inside your code pipeline stages. And here's a little bit of sense of, uh, of what that looks like. So here's a, the code deploy screen. And you can see you've got a nice log at the bottom there so you know who all the actors are, you know who's changing your code, when and why. And you can also track the progress as you go along. So we can get started here with uh, showing the traffic shifting. We can actually see the two versions here. Uh, we can see the status of the deployment, how far we've progressed. If we're, say, doing this over the course of several hours, this will allow us to track the kind of progress that we've made. And then as we go along, we'll see this traffic start to shift. So from 90-10 to 60-40, halfway done, and eventually finishing up with all of our traffic on the new version. So this is, this is really nice if you want to just have something that's ready-made and all set to go. You also have complete API control over both the code deploy capabilities here and, of course, over the underlying primitives like weighted aliases in Lambda. And then in the API gateway, I'll show you the console experience here, but of course it also works through SDKs and APIs, a very similar setting where you can control the traffic split, and you can completely configure all of the settings for the API in those two stages, so you can change anything about it. And then you're also able to come in here and track, this, track the metrics, so you can see how your traffic pattern's been doing and observe whether that API is doing more or less successfully as you progress over time. And while we've done this primarily with API Gateway for the purposes of deployment, you can also use this primitive for anything you like, including A-B testing or different kinds of traffic shaping applications. All right, so Joe had a pretty good day, but then the next day his manager comes back and says, you know what, that app you build is working great, but now we got some more feature requests. I'd like to include some data from a relational database that we've got, and I want you to start calling some of our legacy services so we can add some more features and functionality to the things that you built. You know, you did this thing serverlessly, like is your architecture gonna be able to handle those requirements? And fortunately, Joe can tell her, yeah, not a problem, because he's been watching the reInvent releases this week, so he's not worried. So, Joe goes back to his desk, and it's time to think about how do I deal with some of these legacy pieces here? because he's got a few things to think about. When he's connecting to these enterprise systems, he's gonna have to do several different things. For one thing, he's gonna have to understand his concurrency. He's gonna have to know if that system has a limitation, how close am I to actually hitting it? And he's gonna have, have to be able to exert some control over that so he doesn't overwhelm a back-end system. And then if he's got APIs that have to talk inside a VPC, he's gonna need some connectivity. He's gonna need to be able to reach from the API into the VPC to get access to those existing services. And then finally, you know, he's gonna to have to start doing some of, the, uh, you know, some of the big boy challenges here, like auditing and logging all those invocations and tying into some of his existing logging and monitoring analysis capabilities. So, time for Joe to get started. Now, 
In addition to the thing that Joe's got to do here about protecting a legacy system, we've heard a lot of feedback related to concurrency. Challenges like, how do I protect a serverless function that's running in production from having other functions steal its concurrency away from it? You know, what would happen if somebody ran a load test? Maybe you get a new developer on the team, he fires up a function, doesn't quite know what's going on, and it causes your production system to lose, to lose or get browned out in terms of capacity. People also want to be able to do things like temporarily disabling a function. And so what we've learned from all that feedback over the course of the last several months, and our key insight here is that concurrency control is really a central element of being able to manage the functional piece, the compute part, of a serverless application. So this week, we're releasing two different related capabilities here. The first one is a metric that applies to all functions and all versions that shows you your, current, your concurrency. So this is in addition to the invoke calls, the errors, and everything else. It's a built-in metric, no charge for it. And then, to be able to take advantage of that, the per-function concurrency throttle capability. And with that, you can do all kinds of clever things. You can limit your concurrency to a legacy system. Maybe you're calling an RDS database, and it's running on a smaller instance type, so you can only have so many connections open to it. You can also protect your purely serverless mechanisms in production. So you can distribute and partition the power of concurrency that you've got within your account any way you like across functions, and in a totally backward compatible way. So you're not required to do any of this, but you can set it up for as many or as few functions as you like. And then you can do some really nice stuff as well, like you want to turn a function off temporarily? No problem, just set its concurrency to zero. Want to be able to work on a function without worrying that you're going to get overcharged or get some kind of recursive loop because it deals with S3 and might kind of call back it to you again? Again, no worries. Set its concurrency to one, and then you know that it won't be able to run away on you. So really nice, flexible feature, really simple to use, and you can turn it on from APIs and, uh, and within the console as well. Okay, so that takes care of one of Joe's challenges, but he's not quite done yet. He's also going to need to hook that API up. So for that, he's going to need access to some new API gateway features. Today, we're excited to launch the private link integration. So this is the ability to take an API and punch through into a, into a VPC to reach some service endpoint that sits inside of it. And that's going to allow Joe, in his application now, to be able to call in and get access to those, some of those legacy services, and, and then to expose that API out to, for example, mobile or web apps that he's creating. Now, he might also want to be able to call that API from within the region. And for that, he's going to be excited about the other thing that we announced a little earlier this month, regional endpoints for APIs. Now, regional endpoints let you switch from an edge-optimized API, where you've got a built-in CloudFront distribution, kind of latency optimization around the globe, to one that's optimized for regional traffic, where you're going to be calling from something that's already there. For example, maybe a Lambda function that's part of an application. And with regional API endpoints, you can also do things like bring your own customized uh, distribution in CloudFront if you want to set that up yourself, or even, even use another CDN provider if you want to be able to snap that on, or build multi-region API implementations. So Joe's not quite ready for that one yet, but he is happy about the lower latency and the easy ability to kind of just hook something up within his application here. Now, setting up a VPC integration for API Gateway is really easy. I'll show you the console experience, very much of an analog to the APIs that you would use. We model it essentially as a new integration type. So you set it up uh, as a new integration in API, in API Gateway. And what you can see here is that that link type hooks up to a network load balancer, or an NLB. So you put the NLB, you distribute that traffic to whatever you want to hook up to inside of the VPC, and then you create the integration in API Gateway. Behind the scenes, we'll take care of all of the private link setup to, to make that happen. So we'll kind of deal with the rest of the magic, make that, that endpoint securely visible to your API within our system, and then allow that traffic to punch through. So I wanted to offer you kind of a little handy chart here to think about sort of API gateway connectivity. So as of about a month ago, you could call from internet APIs, or what we call edge-optimized APIs, to other internet endpoints as well as to regional services like Lambda or Step Functions. 
Then what we added for regional endpoints allows you to come in from within the region and hit those same, those same points going out. And as of today, you can also connect to VPC. So you'll see us continue to, to flesh out this matrix as we go along. And then finally, Joe's gonna take advantage of two additional features to make his monitoring life easier. First, he's gonna use structured, uh, structured logging support in API Gateway, uh, which we just announced this week, so that he can get some Apache structured logs and then use that to connect to his existing analytics systems. So he's got a really easy way to make that happen and make it a little easier to kind of look at his log data and search for problems over time. And then on the Lambda side, he's gonna hook up the new CloudTrail support for Lambda functions so he can track each and every invocation. So he's actually got really tight auditing and governance model here now over all of the computation that's happening within his serverless apps. So he's all set for anything that comes down the road, especially if he needs to do regulated workloads. So we're really excited here. Joe and his manager are feeling pretty good about the result. You know, they've got a scalable, reliable, highly available application that also offers fine-grained management capabilities like concurrency controls, a complete CI-CD tool chain, and a whole spectrum now of auditing, compliance, and logging features. Now, to give us a little more of a real-world look at the application of serverless architectures to enterprise solutions, I'd like to welcome Jeet Call, Vice President of Engineering at FICO to the stage, to talk a little bit about FICO's serverless journey. Welcome. Yes. Thank you, Tim. I think the Cloud9 integration is really awesome, and we love this additional capacity. We're going to use more and more of it. Uh, so what's FICO? What do we do? Uh, most of you in US, uh, when you hear the name FICO, you think about the FICO score, and that's a very natural uh, response. Uh, we are the number one credit risk score uh, in the country, and we're talking about 10 billion credit decisions being made every year uh, with FICO score. But what you may not know is how many times you're interacting with FICO technology on a day-to-day -day basis. So case in point, just a few weeks ago, I was uh, in a trip. Um, I get a call from a financial institution saying, uh, there's fraudulent activity on your uh, credit card. We have terminated it, and we have sent a new copy to your home. Clearly, logistically, it was a nightmare, but I was happy. The bank, how it was determining what the fraud was and how it uh, identified this fraud is based on software from FICO. In fact, every time all of you are using your credit cards anywhere in the world, two-thirds of these transactions are going through FICO software. We go through machine learning algorithms to determine is it really you or is it, are you at risk for fraud? Well, it's about 2.6 billion accounts across 9,000 banks. Another example of, of, of FICO software. So I have this harrowing story about airlines. I was flying many, many, many years ago. I was flying from uh, JFK over to Houston International Airport uh, with a connecting flight at St. Louis. I landed in gate four. My connecting flight was in gate 72. I had less than 30 minutes and I was running, barely made that flight. So how do airlines today, in this day and age, with thousands of flights, lots of connections in between across all these airports, make these decisions? Well, if you're Southwest Airlines, you leverage optimization technology and decide how, to, how far these connecting gates need to be. They also leverage the same piece of technology to uh, figure out how to schedule the crews or how to be on time arrival during storms. You know, in some cases, if you're going shopping based on where you're actually shopping things, uh, all of the discount offers that got presented to you are going through thousands of FICO's predictive analytical models uh, to determine, you know, are you going to buy something, especially in this holiday season? If you're flying into US, FICO technology is what TSA uses to identify uh, identity fraud. Are you who you are coming in? So we are everywhere. But we are also a really old company. Been around for 60 years, we are a traditional enterprise software company. Uh, yes, we used to have a lot of COBOL software. 
Yes, today we have, you know, Java and Scala and Go and, you know, you name your uh, favorite language and environment. Uh, we uh, spend a lot of time building and deciding at some point in time we're going to go and do something new. Uh, what I wanted to share with you is our journey to serverless. Because I think that's an interesting uh, part of the conversation to have. Uh, we've been doing on-prem software for a majority of these 60, 60 years. And then we decided at some point in time, OK, mm, we should start thinking about doing something. So 15 years, years ago, we started hosting our customer solution in our own data center. And continued to go in. Cloud came in. And we were like, oh, it's all right. It's fine. Five years ago, we just kind of woke up and said, no, no, we really need to redo our entire software infrastructure. No, there is no lift and shift. We have to redesign everything. Uh, and we need to do it in a cloud-native fashion. So we went and said, OK, what are the requirements? And these are very standard requirements. You know, We have customers that ha do a few transactions uh, a day to customers that need to do batch transactions or hundreds of millions uh, in a day. Uh, other standard stuff, you know, obviously, security is very, very important to us. Uh, we have to be PCI compliant. We do multiple audits every year. Uh, it's, it's, it's part of what we need to do. And performance and scalability matters a lot. Uh, if we are down, our customers are losing millions of dollars uh, for, for, for just a few minutes. So what we ended up basically doing is uh, uh, designing a, a platform and a set of services. Uh, we called it uh, Decision Management Suite. Um, you know, what does it mean to you? Uh, let me kind of use a real-life example to explain to you guys uh, what we are doing with this software. Uh, let's think about you going to a bank and saying, I need a personal loan. Or you going to a store at Macy's and you want to buy something and you want to use their uh, store credit card. Uh, you're going to put in a loan application. It's going to go through, and you'll get a response. Yes, you've gotten this loan, or you, have, you haven't gotten this loan. So our customers basically are what we call business analysts. So in this case, it would be a risk officer either at a bank or at, at the store, at a retail store. Uh, this person, he or she, has to sit down in front of a browser, uh, very interactively has to determine what is the input they need. You know, age, uh, where do you live, uh, what is your income, uh, and a whole lot of other items that need to get entered in. And then pick a model that will help determine, should you get this credit? What interest rate should you get in? And once that is done, this uh, loan application needs to get pushed in for approval and for testing. And after that, it gets pushed into production. So when you come in and say, here's the loan, it goes in. And currently, in the architecture that we had built, we deployed uh, these applications as microservices on old Linux containers. If you guys still remember LXCs, uh, they were around, and we deployed them and scaled them on that. So when you Request came in and went as a web services call into these containers, get a response back, and the decision was you got a loan or you did not get a loan. We also have to do something extra here uh, because for audit and regulatory purposes, we have to save every transaction that gets made in because we have to be able to answer why do, how did you make a decision to reject somebody? What were the rules that you used? So we save that, and we then leverage this data that we get saved in a, in a data mart back to the risk officer so they can continue to fine tune their uh, applications, they can do a better job of managing risk on this one. So as you can imagine, we deployed it for a couple of years. Everything was working wonderfully and realized we had created a massive problem for ourselves. We were in production. Our traffic is sinusoidal. You know, it comes and goes down. But we were uh, designed for peak. In test environments, in staging, in, in, in training environments, this seems all you know, obvious and normal. Uh, where we should have been basically coming in as the request was coming in, we had designed for a peak. The other part we had to do and leverage through here was uh, uh, infrastructure had to get managed. Whenever there were any security issues, uh, we had to go in and do an update across everything. All of our customer deployments had to get updated. And while we are doing all of this work, the ground underneath was shifting. The, the new container uh, architecture came in. We had to come back and incorporate that in there. You know, there was a new kit on the block as far as orchestration of uh, containers was concerned. We had to take that in, take the new version in. 
and we were in this constant run of staying on top. We're an enterprise company. Our value is somewhere else, and we were spending all our time figuring out how to stay on top of this exercise. So we still had to solve this problem. We had this infrastructure and architecture. We still had to solve this problem. We were costing a lot of money to our customers by having all of these idle uh, servers running around, or idle containers running around. So we went and said, OK, we're going to relook at all of this stuff. Uh, we, we had lots of Joes uh, hanging around. We said, OK, uh, let's start working on this. Let's figure out how we will do. A lot of open source software came in years ago to say, OK, you can predict what your volume is, and you can scale up and down. We started looking at that, incorporating that. Uh, then one of our engineers, uh, not named Joe, came in and said, why aren't we using Lambda? And no, you, you, we use Lambda to do triggers for some small actions all over the place. And you're like, what? You're talking about using machine learning models, executing these predictive analytic models, rules in Lambda? It's like mind blown. And we went in, he did a POC, we got really great results, and we were sold. We completely turned everything upside down. Lambda is the heart of our strategy. We really, really, really like Lambda. So let me kind of go in and talk through what we are doing, the same kind of a flow, risk officer coming in and designing this loan application. These assets now created, rather than getting deployed in a container, get saved into S3. And then, whether there's a test environment or a production environment or a staging environment, all of that is coming through and uh, going through Lambda now. So your loan application goes through an API gateway, through the Lambda function, gets a response, and then event gets generated to say, OK, we capture that in Kinesis and save that in S3 that we can query around back in. What are the things we're trying to do this? First, we said, OK, we're going to use Lambda only for request and response. And we didn't want to do batch with that, because in batch, what we had done earlier, we had used uh, uh, Spark. We wanted to do a whole lot of transactions, hundreds of millions of transactions in a short period of time. We had spent time figuring out integrating Spark with that. But now we're sitting back and thinking, well, you know, Lambda can scale. It can do all of this stuff. So we moved in and started doing batch. We're talking about hundreds of millions of transactions in a day with Lambda. We have now one architecture for request response and for batch using Lambda. That's a big change for us. So, you know, big question here. Every time you come back in here, Lambda's, you know, costs a little less. You, you look and say, yeah, you expect it, but you get shocked when you go to the console and look at the difference in the price. It is just mind-boggling from what we were doing before and what we're doing with Lambda. And our Joe uh, uh, was able to put this uh, application as a POC together um, very, very quickly. Yes, of course, it took several months for us to you know, work through productization, uh, cold start, solve that problem, um, you know, reaching out to Tim and saying, we need help here. Uh, but the actual work just took very little time to incorporate in here. And, uh, you can just imagine the ability for us not to have uh, all the operational costs, all the operational overhead, all, all the nightmares of having to do yet another uh, container architecture in here. So if I'm going to leave you guys with one thought, um, you know, for those of you who are looking at, thinking about maybe you should do serverless or not, you know, just dive in. It was phenomenal for our developers. It, fundamentally just unchained them from constraints. Thank you. It's really exciting seeing the kind of, of transformation in use that, uh, that uh, FICO has been able to make of serverless. We're really excited about the, the prospects of that and the kind of experiences that they've been able to generate, both the cost savings, the agility there, and of course, like getting rid of some of the challenges of infrastructure management. And you know, those are somewhat common themes across a lot of the customers that, uh, that we work with. You know, Lambda has been adopted now for, uh, by customers of all sizes, from you know, these Fortune, Fortune 100 companies, some who've been around for over a century, to 
you know, two-person startups who are just looking to kind of go all in on serverless and build their, in, their, entire, their entire infrastructure plan around that capability. I want to give you a couple of other, uh, a few other examples here. And just kind of chosen from sort of across the board. You know, so companies like iRobot, they do over a thousand Lambda deploys every day. They use it to run their backend infrastructure. And they've got over two million connected robots they're projecting by, uh, by 2018. So a really large kind of device-centric IoT use case there, completely powered by a serverless backend. Fannie Mae is a, is a great example of just an embarrassingly, massively parallel solution. You know, they've, they've got 20 million mortgage calculations um, that they need to do in a short span of time. And by converting to serverless, they were able to leverage that off of their on-premise data center and use Lambda and exploit it as a big data computation engine. And they can actually do that a lot faster and far cheaper than they were able to do before. So they get a lot of those benefits off of treating Lambda as kind of their new version of Big Iron. Nextdoor replaced Apache Flume with a data ingestion pipeline. They're handling over three billion events every day. So a great example of serverless applications being done at scale. HomeAway prepares uh, uploaded photos. Um, they do six million a month. And they can, they can do those at over 1,000 TPS per second, you know, even for large photo translations. If you've ever had a vehicle accident at the side of a road and you've had to call for help or get some kind of tow truck, there's a good chance that Agero was kind of powering some of that experience for you. You know, they do accident detection and all kinds of, of, of related capabilities. And they built an app in just a, a few weeks. It was astonishing how quickly they were able to get this, uh, get this to market. And then they've handled over a billion Lambda requests with that app since. And one of the really interesting things was you know, they went through their capacity planning exercise, like many of us do, going to market. Turns out they were blown away by additional customer demand. So they had many times more customers than they thought that they would. And so they, they had the advantage, however, of having architected serverlessly. So they didn't have to go back and buy more machines. They didn't have to worry about the capacity. They were all set up. The app just naturally scaled with them. And finally, I'll leave you with the one from, from Rebel here. Um, they do video transcoding. And they've been able to reduce both the time and the cost by over 95% versus their server-based system. So another great example of doing a huge parallel computation built on top of Lambda and serverless technologies. So really excited about just kind of a sample here of some of the breadth and depth of things that people are doing with this approach. Now, in addition to kind of doing a lot of different workloads, we, of course, want to make serverless available not just to everyone, but also everywhere. And with our recent launch of API Gateway and Lambda in Beijing, these services are now available in every commercial AWS region, including GovCloud. We also, in case you missed it just a few days ago, announced new features for Lambda at Edge. This is our latency-optimized and CloudFront-connected Lambda capability. And we've added a whole bunch of, of new, uh, kind of new capability to this one, including content-based origin selection, the ability to actually break out of that container and call any, any other AWS service endpoint that you like, binary encoding for the responses, and in fact, you get access to a lot of the new Lambda capabilities we talked about here today, like the three gigabyte sizing. So lots of new capabilities for Lambda at Edge as well. Now, one of the nice things about having done some of these latency optimizations is that you can also bring Lambda to increasingly latency-sensitive applications, including those that uh, Lambda at Edge is designed to help with CloudFront events for. We've also been hard at work at our assurance programs. So earlier this year, we added PCI and HIPAA to, our, to that list, and we've just recently announced support for SOC 1 through C as well. So if you're thinking of using a serverless approach for finance, for healthcare, or for any other kind of regulated industry or use case, you're all set to go. And you'll see us continuing investing in these assurance programs going forward. We've also been hard at work making Lambda for devices ever more powerful. And because we have a lot of IoT coverage here, I don't, I don't have a separate set of slides here for things like Greengrass, where we've been putting things like access to local capabilities on the device, over-the-air updates, and the preview that we announced this week for machine language inferencing on the devices. Really excited about some of the things that are happening there, and of course, things like our DeepLens 
offering here where Lambda and Greengrass capability can actually reside on a camera. And finally, we've also uh, uh, pre-announced this week that we'll be delivering support for the .NET Core CLR 2.0 in Lambda over the course of the coming weeks here. So, ton of progress on all things serverless this week. Now, I'd be remiss if I said we were doing all of this alone. Far from it. So not only other AWS teams, but we've got a robust and growing ecosystem of open source, commercial partners, and startups in the serverless space. And they're doing everything from frameworks that help you with specific vertical applications like web apps for Python or Node, to things like monitoring and logging, to CICD pipelines and other kinds of tool chain capabilities. It's been really exciting to kind of see this multi-dimensional sort of explosive growth in the ecosystem over the course of the last year. It's an incredibly vibrant time, and there's still a lot of space here. So if you're the kind of person who thinks about doing a startup, you know, this is a, this is a really fun area to get into. You know, it's been an incredibly busy year. I hope I didn't forget anything here. Was there maybe another language that people were interested in? So I don't get uh, 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 yells from the, uh, the, the crowd here. Um, I want to, to talk a little bit about uh, the newest language that's going to be joining our family here, uh, which is Go. So I'm kind of back in the Cloud9 IDE here. And you can see a really simple little uh, sort of hello world program here with Go. So I'll show you how easy this is. This is a line that you import here. This basically brings sort of a little Go connector to Lambda, allows us to kind of fire up those, those binaries and give them the information they need as far as the request and the context goes. And then I make a lambda.start call for that, and that's it. So with those two lines of code, I'm able to take an existing Go program and get it all ready to run in Lambda. And I'm going to just quickly kind of run this here. So there's my Go code running. I'll uh, go ahead and open up the, um, open up my output file here. Simple example, but you see this actually running on our production system. We're finalizing our load testing and other kind of go-to-market activities around this now. And like Core CLR, you'll see this coming in the, you'll see this in the coming weeks. So we're really excited about having that. We know this has been a, a much requested language. And again, you can turn any Go program into a Lambda function with those two lines. That connector is going to be fully open sourced, and you'll see this out in very early 2018. So some things that you can do today, and I invite you to come and check out that, the new Lambda editor and the design pane experience in there. Of course, take Cloud9 for a spin. I've been using it over the course of the last month. It's just been a whole lot of fun to be able to have those built-in capabilities. If you are a console user, try gra do the little the grab and go logs that I demoed up here and talked about. Really nice way to be able to kind of drive some fast, iterative, interactive diagnostics. Of course, sign up for the serverless application preview. We've started to populate those already. You should see a few in by the end of the day here. Um, and as we let people into the preview, we'll also be having folks publish more in there, both partners, more from us, and of course, inviting all of you to do those as well. So we're looking forward not just to granting access to that capability, but to growing the content and the size of those apps, because ultimately, it's a lot of what you do that's going to help each other in this ecosystem, in this space. And of course, please follow us uh, on social media. Um, there's so much going on this week that's going to be a lot of discussion, communication, uh, and of course, continuing to kind of talk about the things that we're doing. And of course, a bunch of these things like Go and Core CLR, which we'll be wrapping up and, uh, and getting out into your hands in the coming weeks here. Thank you so much. It's been a really fun year. I appreciate everybody coming by here this afternoon. Thanks.